Hey, hey, everybody. Merry Christmas and happy almost new year. Thanks for hopping on with us today. This is Camille from Camille's Paleo Kitchen, and I am joined by a very special guest, Jeremy Hendon from Keto 40. Hi, Jeremy. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Uh, so Jeremy is joining us from Lisbon, Portugal. Awesome right. place on the other side of the globe. I guess I'm sort of on the other <laughs> side of the globe in Maui. Um, it is, it's a very long way. The flights there take about 25 to 30 hours. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's a cool, it's a really cool area though. I, I enjoyed, I took a, I did four weeks in Spain and like another 10 days in, uh, in Portugal. Like it feels like two lifetimes ago. It was actually <laughs> 13 years ago. Oh my gosh. Wow. It was certainly another lifetime ago now that it's I have It's very different then. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. So um, one of the things that um, people are always inquiring about is, um, is just the difference between paleo and keto. And, um, and specifically, you know, now that the new year is coming and people are most interested in losing weight, yeah. what what's the difference for weight loss so that is what we are going to dig into today um if this is your first time with us please uh send us a little message let us know where you're joining us from and if you have any questions for jeremy throughout the course of our call uh please put those in the chat and um i think that we will uh we will just get get the show rolling um the first thing I want to do is just tell you a little bit about Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy grew up in Georgia and became interested in health and particularly weight loss 20 years ago. This passion has led him to start, uh, led him to start a grain free food manufacturing business, a healthy living digital magazine, as well as websites on health and nutrition. He is the co-founder of the Keto Summit and Paleo Flourish. So again, welcome, welcome, Jeremy, and thank you for being with us. Thank you. It sounds like so, a lot more when you when you say it all together. I know. <laughs> Any anytime people read my bios for summits, I'm like, oh wow, I've done some cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice it's a nice little reminder. I know. <laughs> so let's let's jump right on in um, and just just talk about first of all the difference between paleo and keto. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm actually glad that you also mentioned weight loss because I feel like that's an easy way to start thinking about it. And the reason is is you know, the biggest difference between is what the purpose of each diet is and each way of eating. And that mm -hmm. is paleo, when we think about it, it's actually not, you know, a lot of people lose weight on a paleo diet, but that's not really what a paleo diet is built to be. A paleo yeah. diet is built to increase the amount of nutrients we eat, increase the amount of vitamins and minerals, and decrease the amount of inflammatory foods that we eat. Things like gluten and processed seed oils, things that cause inflammation in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And often a side effect of that can be that people lose weight because we know a lot of people who lose weight on a paleo diet. Definitely. But when we think of, when we think about a paleo diet, that's not what a paleo diet is built for. Mm -hmm. um, a keto diet um, was originally used for other purposes like epilepsy in the early 20th century. But the way that a lot of people use a keto diet now, particularly in, in the short term, is that it can be used as a tool for weight loss. Mm -hmm. So in particular, People who've had problems losing weight, who have problems with their blood sugar, problems with insulin sensitivity, those people tend on average to have very good success with a keto diet because it forces your body to burn fat rather than burn just carbs as fuel. It's called metabolic flexibility. Mm -hmm. And it's something that it keeps a lot of people, metabolic inflexibility at least, from losing weight. So for me, that's how I always like to start out explaining the, diff the big differences is just on this kind of underlying basis that a paleo diet, and uh, I, I don't want to jump ahead in your questions because I want to let you ask the questions, but to a degree, you know, Louise and I feel like everybody should be at the root on a paleo diet. That is eating primarily unprocessed foods that are mm -hmm. high in vitamins and minerals, low in inflammatory ingredients or in inflammatory foods that would cause problems in our body. And then when people need to or want to, when they need more energy or when they want to lose weight or when they want more mental clarity, and this doesn't have to be forever, they can go on a keto diet. And that mm -hmm. is not switching off of a paleo diet, but just incorporating, you know, cutting down the carbs on their paleo diet such that it forces their body to rely primarily on fats 
rather than just on uh, starches or on sugars. Right. And then also having more of an awareness of, um, of the amount of protein you're eating, not eating too much protein and making sure that you are getting in enough fat. So more yeah. of a, an awareness of the macronutrients than you may have by just eating paleo alone. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, that's kind of the basis of a keto diet is it's based mostly around the macros. Like you said, eating more fats, eating less carbs. And there's, there's always a little bit of disagreement about protein. Uh, you know, uh, eating too much can definitely cause you not to go as deep in ketosis. Mm -hmm. Although for us, you know, if people looking for weight loss, being deep in ketosis doesn't always, isn't always necessary. And when I say deep, um, what ketosis actually is for somebody's body, if somebody's listening and doesn't understand is when your body breaks down fat, either fat that you've eaten or fat that's stored in your body, one of the byproducts of that breakdown are called ketone bodies. And scientifically, you're said to be in ketosis when your blood has a certain amount of ketone bodies over a certain level. And so, you know, if key ketosis, that is the, the actual state of being in ketosis, has been used for a lot of different things over the years, a lot of medical conditions, and I don't think we'll get too much in that, into that today. But if you're using it to treat a medical condition, it makes sense to be very deep in ketosis. If you're trying to lose weight, it doesn't, I mean, it's not bad to be too deep into ketosis, but you don't necessarily need to be. And so a lot of people talk about, oh, do I need to track, how much do I need to track? Do I need to be, you know, over one millimole or over three millimoles? And for us, when we're talking about weight loss, those things aren't as important as, you know, do you, are you losing weight, first of all? <laughs> do, you, do you feel good? Do you have more energy? Um, and, and to some degree, you know, it can be useful to measure just because it can tell you how well your body's reacting after a few days. But it's not something that we necessarily encourage people to chase. That is trying to get to three millimoles or four millimoles or, what, you know, some people really want you to go deep into it. So, mm -hmm. um, so Amy Joel is asking um, food wise, uh, what is the difference between paleo and keto? So I, I you, you, we started, we sort of answered the question. Um, I, I would say the, the, the first thing food wise is the similar foods but far less carbohydrates. Um, so thinking of keto is eating paleo friendly foods, but not the, you know, not the sweet potatoes, not the pineapple. fruit. <laughs> what? Pineapple. I was, yeah. Right. Like your high not, sugar fruit. Yeah. Not right. Not all, not all of the fruits, not all of the, um, sweet potatoes or cassava flowers or um, paleo sweeteners, paleo baked goods. Um, right. I've seen some people use, uh, I've seen spaghetti squash in some keto yeah. recipes, which was confusing to me. It's actually not that high in carbs. Oh. Um, and so, so the way, you know, when we make meal plans and we have keto meal plans and you mentioned the keto 40 and part of the keto 40, we have meal plans there. And we tend to leave out most foods that are, potentially too high in carbs. But to be fair, you know, you could eat an apple a week and still stay in ketosis because apples aren't going to spike your blood sugar that much. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not that every food has to be off limits. It depends on how you want to do it. For people who are just starting out, we recommend them to avoid for a little while pretty much all fruits, pretty much all um, root vegetables, that is your sweet potatoes, uh, your, your plantains, Squashes. your cassava, things mm -hmm. like that. But but in the end, there there can be some exceptions to that if you get deeper into it and you know what you're doing. So spaghetti squash uh, does not actually have that many carbs, that much starch, uh, not as much as you'd think. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you, know, you can eat it occasionally and, and be fine. And it also depends on who we're talking about. So right. somebody who's very active, who's very athletic, uh, you know, they might be able to eat 60, 70 grams of carbs a day and stay in ketosis. Um, somebody who's not very active, maybe who has blood sugar issues, might have to get down to 10 or 20 uh, to stay in ketosis. Right. Um, so um, Amy Joel has, a, or Amy Joel also asked, um, are either of these dangerous if you have high blood pressure? So, uh, you know, there's always a disclaimer on this, that if you have high blood pressure, and, you know, a lot of people think we say these disclaimers because we're worried about liability or whatever, but realistically, if you have high blood pressure, definitely listen to your doctor and consult medical professionals on this because you can have high blood pressure for a lot of different reasons. There can be different underlying factors. And so, um, you know, to say that something is good for high blood pressure, or bad for high blood pressure, or dangerous or not dangerous, 
it's, it's really hard in individual circumstances. So I'm going to give a general answer, but, you know, definitely consult with your medical professional before you, you do anything. And possibly um, maybe at like a functional, a functional, doc, a sure. functional medicine doctor would probably be a, a wiser choice because they would have some idea, probably some understanding of the keto diet and its benefits versus a, a more conventional doctor may just say, oh, my gosh, why would you ever eat so much fat? That is going to give you a heart attack. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, from what we've seen and from what the studies seem to show, and I'm sort of a geek, so I read tons and tons of studies, uh, there, there's really, from what we've seen, keto diets don't really increase high blood pressure at all. Um, if anything, a lot of people lose weight on keto diets. A lot of people reduce inflammation, and those things tend over time to reduce high blood pressure. Uh, so it tends to be in general, good for a lot of people, both anecdotally and within scientific studies. Mm -hmm. So that's you know that's the general answer. Uh, but again, individually, you know, it's something that you kind of have to to look after yourself to figure out why you have high blood pressure, what's causing it, and, and to deal with it. And I know, um, sorry to jump around, but somebody else asked. I saw a question about cholesterol. Yep, I was just going to ask that. It's very it's a very similar answer there, although. You know, I'll give the same individual answer. You're going to consult with your medical professional. But there, interestingly, there are certain portions of the population, I would say, and, and you know, give or take 5%, there's about 80% of the population that when they go keto, their cholesterol gets much better. Their LDL goes down, their total cholesterol goes down, their uh, HDL goes up, particularly if they're exercising while they're on keto. And so in general, for about 80% of the population, keto will tend to do very well. There's about 20% of the population, and it tends to coincide with the 20% of the population that's got familial hyper, hyper, familial, familial hypercholesterolemia. Sorry, <laughs> can't speak tonight. And uh, that percentage of the population, if they're eating a fair amount of saturated fats, tends to see their cholesterol go up. And mm -hmm. so it's sort, sort of something that you have to look at yourself individually. You know, four but, out of five. Just, right, but just because even your, and I've, I've, done some listening to this, like Chris Kresser has a lot of talks about right. this, but um, the cholesterol actually, even if it is the bad cholesterol, is not even necessarily a good marker in and of itself. Yeah, yeah Always absolutely. Having to look behind why is it that, like what's really actually happening and a functional medicine doctor is going yeah. to give you more helpful um, feedback yeah. Than a normal yeah, doctor I mean, who is who is looking to you know, like maybe give you a statin to yeah. lower your you know lower your cholesterol, cholesterol when the cholesterol may not be problematic for you at all. Yeah. So for me and for my family and my mom has high blood pressure, has high cholesterol. I used to have high cholesterol. Like for me, when it comes to me and my family, you know, I I refer much more to inflammatory markers because <clears> inflammation <throat> is the primary driver of atherosclerosis and many of the problems that come with cholesterol rather than the cholesterol levels themselves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certain other markers tend to be proxies like the, the particle size of cholesterol and things like that. So right. there are a lot of different things you can look at. Um, but that said, you know, if you're one of those 20% who t whose cholesterol tends to go up and if it goes up a fair amount when you're eating a lot of saturated fat, you can still do a keto diet, but maybe move in some more of the monounsaturated fats, uh, a lot more olive oil than coconut oil, things like that. If your body just happens to respond to a better, more fish than beef, uh, you know, there are certain people that do better with that. Uh, even on an inflammatory level. Yeah, I just did. Um, I'm going to be interviewing a woman from a genomics uh, toolkit, I think it's called. But basically, they take right. your 23andMe results and then they actually give you some information that is, is helpful. And right. um, and I learned some really interesting things just about myself and the kinds of foods that from a genetic standpoint, I should be eating and avoiding. And so I think that, you know, in general, it is really important to just to, just to begin to learn and understand your own body and do some digger deep, dig, some dig, some deeper, <laughs> digging, some deeper digging in. Um, and what is it that is going to work for my body and paleo being paleo being a template. And I think keto being a really great tool for some people. Yeah. Um, one right. thing I want to make sure that we cover um, also following up from about the difference in food specifically is I know that in a lot of keto cookbooks, I see lots of dairy and yeah, lots of cheese. 
Yeah, a lot of cheese, a lot of cream. It all <laughs> looks delicious. I <laughs> I did keto two winters ago. And even though I know for myself I do not do well with dairy, I love dairy, I yeah. love cheese. And because I saw it in the keto cookbook and I was doing the keto thing, I then gave myself permission to eat all of it. Right. And it still was not a good idea. <laughs> so uh, do, you, do you have anything that you want to say about dairy and maybe yeah. the confusion that may, many people have? Because most paleo people don't do a whole lot of dairy, but some yeah. people do. And if you follow Mark Sisson and Primal, then it's just a confusing area for some. And, and in fact, you're right. If you look at most keto websites, if you look at most keto. Oh. Cookbooks, oh. they will have a primary eating in ketosis. And for me in particular, sorry, did. We're just, get, I think that the internet connection is going a little slow. You're getting a little oh, choppy. I think it got a little better now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, no, now no, it's good. Can you start that sentence again? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I, was, I was saying you're absolutely right. Many, many keto websites, most keto cookbooks, they have dairy. And if you look at them, they have a lot of cheese. And the reason is, is what you referenced earlier, is that the primary point of keto is to get into ketosis. That is to decrease the amount of carbs, increase the amount of fat you eat. And so a lot of keto cookbooks and blogs and other things don't focus on food quality as a part of keto. And when I say food quality, I mainly mean inflammatory foods, uh, avoiding inflammatory foods and increasing the number of foods that you eat that are high in nutrients, vitamins and minerals. Mm -hmm. And so for us, I, I'm really big on avoiding dairy for most people for two reasons. Uh, the first is that, and this is just a practical one, it's very easy to overeat. It's very, very easy to eat a lot of cheese, to eat a lot of cream and to get a ton of calories. And, and here's the thing, a keto diet is not magic, right? You're not magically losing weight. One of the main benefits, and people undersell this, but one of the main benefits is keto keeps you full. It it's stops so you from true. Having, yeah, it stops you from having cravings. It gives you a lot of energy so that you don't feel like you need to eat all the time. I almost had and, to force myself to eat when I was doing <laughs> keto, which was not a good thing because yeah. I was I was breastfeeding and I'm still breastfeeding, sure. and I found for myself that my milk supply was um, was had been yeah. impacted by it, and part of it was just because. I was never hungry. It was <laughs> well, weird. And, and so my friend Chris Kelly, he works with a lot of athletes and uh, a lot of, you know, they're not necessarily professional, but they're often semi-pro or very serious hobbyist athletes. And they're maybe out biking for two or three hours a day, almost every day. And they run into that same problem, not, not producing enough milk, but, uh, you know, not eating enough because they're not hungry. And so they won't eat enough. They won't get enough calories. And then they, you know, they'll get tired halfway through their ride. Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, why am I getting tired? Well, it's not because keto was a problem for them. It's just that they weren't eating enough. And, you know, in general, for most people, if you want to lose weight, that's a really good thing. And if you're not super active or you're not breastfeeding, it's a super good thing to not be hungry and to not need to eat all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's and, and going back to dairy. That's one of the reasons we avoid dairy. Dairy, much like you know, nuts are another one. And we still allow nuts on keto. But, you know, there are certain foods that are very easy to eat. But the other reason with dairy is that dairy for a lot of people is inflammatory, particularly processed dairy, particularly um, pasteurized dairy mm -hmm. becomes inflammatory for a lot of people. A lot of people notice sinus issues uh, as soon as they start eating dairy. They'll notice their nose will start running and their sinuses will get congested. Some people notice their joints feel a little bit stiff, all, all, all very common signs of inflammation. Sometimes your skin will break out. And so for those two reasons, for the practical reason of not eating it and for the inflammatory reason, um, that's the reason that, you know, all of our meal plans, all of our recipes, everything we do leaves out dairy because we like to have a paleo base for that reason. Uh, theoretically, unprocessed, unpasteurized dairy can be really healthy for, for people who are healthy otherwise. Right. So theoretically, it can be great. You know, I'll sometimes drink raw milk when I'm in a place where I can get it, like California, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not keto at those times. Uh, so theoretically, it can be great. But in general, it's, it's best to avoid it, particularly if you want to lose weight. I think that a lot of us, I'm talking about myself, but others just, it is so cheese, especially it's so <laughs> hyper palatable. It's delicious. Oh, yeah. And we're all looking for that little loophole that'll let us, that'll let <laughs> us eat all the cheese. And so, yeah. so yeah. Well, that's, 
And you know, those loopholes and the hyper palatability is why a lot of people end up over time, particularly after a couple of months, having trouble losing weight on paleo. A lot mm-hmm. of people will lose weight the first month or two, but then they'll figure out that they can make paleo cupcakes and they can make paleo cookies. And all of a sudden you've got hyper palatable paleo foods mm-hmm. and they're better. They're more mm-hmm. nutritious. They're less inflammatory. So they're better, but they're still hyper palatable. You're still eating a lot of them. Yeah. And that's why, that's why we're actually a big fan of sprints. Um, and this is a notion that comes from er- other areas of the business world, but that is doing something like a keto diet for a short time. You don't need to do it forever. You can do it for a long time. People have done them for decades. And so mm-hmm. there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. But for a lot of people, we find that we like to get them on a paleo base that is eating very nutritious, non-inflammatory foods. And mm-hmm. then when they want to lose weight for 40 days or for two months or three months, putting them on a, a paleo keto diet, cutting right. down their carbs and having them lose weight. And then maybe for a month or two, they go back to eating carbs, you know, eat some fruits, eat some sweet potatoes, fine. And maybe they even gain a couple pounds over that month or two, but it's okay because they're letting their body kind of recover. And then right. maybe you can do another month And your or two. body being able, is it your point of view that your body being able to cycle in and out of being a carb or a sugar burner versus a fat burner and having that flexibility, is that, is that a good thing for a person's body? Oh, absolutely. And evolutionarily, it's the way all humans evolved, right? We should, well, so if you think about it, just not even long term, think about it just in terms of a day, right? You, so take a koala. A koala is, <laughs> you know, koala is like most bears. Um, you know, if you could trace them back millions of years, their ancestors actually ate a fair amount of meats, fats, things, but because of their environment, they had to evolve to live on things like eucalyptus and a lot of plants. Well, the problem is they don't get a whole lot of calories from that. And also it's, it's carb and starch heavy. And so koalas have to eat. I, I don't remember the exact amount of time, but they eat like 18 or 20 hours a day. And it's because they always need to have the energy coming in. Mm-hmm. Humans evolved not to have to do that. And most animals did too. That is, you will eat breakfast and or you'll eat lunch, whatever your first meal is. And for 30 minutes to an hour after that, whatever you ate, there's always some carbs in it. It will have, you'll have some sugar either in your blood or stored in your lean tissue, like your muscle tissue or your liver, some glycogen. And your body will rely on that. And that's great. You know, you can rely on sugar for a little while. But then an hour later, you don't have any more blood sugar left, particularly if you were active. And right. your body relies on fat. And that's, that's how it should be. You should be able to switch back and forth like that. Um, you don't need to do it all the time. You don't need to do it every most, day so you can go keto. But. Right. But most of us don't have that flexibility anymore, do we? Mostly you just have <laughs> like a blood sugar spike and then a blood sugar crash and then you're hangry. Right. So what's that all about? We, we why all, are we not able, why are Americans not able to bounce back and forth now? Yeah, it's... um. Honestly, uh, you know, that question goes a little bit deep into cellular metabolism. Okay. And um, with, without, without going too deep into it, what tends to happen is when we eat too many, when we get too much energy input uh, in general, when we eat too many calories over time, um, you know, that, that'll get stored as fat. And the more you store, when you start trying to stuff more and more energy into a cell, it starts to damage the mitochondria. And so your body has an automatic react, not automatic, but over time it has a reaction to try to keep energy out of that cell. And that actually, that becomes insulin resistance. That's actually most of where insulin resistance come from, comes from. Mm-hmm. And when that happens and you become insulin resistant, that's insulin resistant. That's when you start developing metabolic inflexibility because mm-hmm. when you're insulin resistant, your body doesn't also doesn't have the ability to take energy out of those fat cells. And this is a slight oversimplification. But that's in general where that metabolic flexibility comes from. So it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit deep into cellular metabolism where, where it comes from. But you're right. The fact of the matter is, in general, particularly Americans, but a lot of people around the globe with processed food, with modern food, we've lost a lot of that metabolic flexibility. Mm-hmm. And it's something that we need to regain because we should be able to eat some sugars occasionally or some starch, you know, have a sweet potato, mm-hmm. burn some of that as sugar, burn some of that as glycogen, but then mostly rely on the fat in our body because that's where energy gets stored for more than an hour or two after meals or you, if you didn't eat for four or five days, you'd be taking it from your fat cells. And right. that's a great thing. Right. And so does, does keto help you to regain that flexibility? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, 
Uh, I think the two best ways to do it are to do fasting, which is hard for most people if you don't have metabolic flexibility because for the first two or three days, it's going to feel terrible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or, uh, or keto, a keto diet. A keto diet is fantastic. And within two or three days, you can regain a fair amount of metabolic flexibility. Uh, you know, it can take time to regain your full metabolic flexibility. Right. But within a few days, you can regain a lot. And it's because all you're doing is cutting down the carbs. So after a day or so, your body doesn't have any more starch or sugar to rely on. Right. And so your body's not to going tap, to. It has to tap yeah. into the fat to live. Right. It's not going to starve itself to death when you've got a lot of fat and energy there. Right. Uh, it's eventually going to figure out how to do it again. But, right. Yeah. So. Awesome. Awesome. So for those of you who are just joining us, my guest is Jeremy Hendon, and we are talking about paleo versus keto and what is better for weight loss. If this is your first time here, leave us a comment. Let us know where you're calling in from or where you're messaging in from. And if you have any questions, let us know. Um, I do have another question here that I want to go to. This is from uh, Suzette Farid. She said, Years ago, I followed the Atkins diet where I kept my carb level at 45 max per day. Yes, I lost weight and I also did not feel hungry. I checked my ketone levels each day to be sure I was in ketosis. My problem was that I became majorly constipated. What should a person do so this doesn't happen? And maybe also maybe talk about the difference between an Atkins diet and the keto diet because there are differences. Yeah, there are different um, the difference is a little hard to explain because Atkins, uh, you know, he changed what he did over the from the mid 70s through the, the, the mid to late 80s. And also, you know, now there are versions of modified Atkins. Um, so, I mean, Atkins mainly ran a low carb, which was pretty strict for the first two to three weeks. Like often we get very obese patients and it would be very much a keto diet for the first couple of weeks. Uh, but well, but he he did, did he have any regulations on protein intake, though? I think that's what a lot of. Yeah, you're right. I don't think he did. Yeah. And and that and what I think there's a fair amount of research that shows us that having that eating pure protein is also can be really hard on your on your kidneys and on your body. Yeah, yeah. I I don't think it's too hard on your kidneys unless you already have kidney uh, like renal failure of some sort. But yeah, I mean, but definitely, you know, I think you're right. I don't think he limited protein at all in the beginning. And then he went through phases. Eventually, he'd even reintroduce wheat and bread. And I think in the fourth (laughs) or fifth phase of it. So uh, definitely don't do that. Uh, But um, yeah, so so yeah, there are definitely differences. Um, But to get to that, she but she was asking about one. she was asking about the constipation. One yeah. of the things could have been, uh, I'm just going to give my own answer, yeah, could have been um, not eating enough vegetables. I don't know yeah. if Atkins was really into veggies, but eating a lot of vegetables gives you the fiber, helps keep things passing through. That would be yeah. that would be one thing. People, so many people don't eat enough vegetables. Now, I'm guilty of this. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not actually promoting uh, our product. We actually just came out with a fiber supplement partially for this reason. Even on Paleo, we see so many people who don't eat enough vegetables. And if you look back historically, the amount of fiber that humans ate is so much more than we eat now, so much even more mm-hmm. than what the RDA, like the recommended daily allowance in the U.S. is. So definitely getting your fiber. Uh, one of the other most common things is water, just not drinking mm-hmm. enough water. Uh, water can help with constipation, movement, working out can actually help with it a lot. Um, and then there's, you know, honestly, I, I got to give the medical disclaimer again. If you're constipated for more than a couple of days, uh, it actually can become dangerous. Yeah. Um, people don't realize this, but. Well, that's the, your, yeah, it's your body's yeah. major or detox pathway. Right. Yeah. So if that happens, you know, see, you know, do something about it, <laughs> you know, medical professional <laughs> or otherwise, uh, you know, figure it out because it can be dangerous. But most common reasons are the first one you said, fiber, water. Uh, and then one thing that can help is moving enough, exercising, mm-hmm. lifting weights can help. Yeah, totally. Um, so I have another question. This is from Amy Joel. She said, so could I just do fasting instead of keto and get the same metabolic results? Good question. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. And you will get a lot of the same metabolic results, <laughs> uh, but it depends on what you're looking for. Uh, in fact, with, I still do fasting once or twice a year. I'll do fasts of, you know, like five or six days because I think it actually has some other benefits in terms of cellular autophagy that is killing off certain uh, parts of cells that should be killed off. 
uh, and also killing off precancerous cells. And, and just in general, I think it's a good thing to do, I think, psychologically. Um, so I still do that, uh, even apart from going to ketosis from time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, but that said, you know, if somebody, you know, we started off this talking about weight loss. And if somebody's looking for weight loss, I really think keto is usually the easier way to go. You know, we have records of people going 300, 400 days of fasting who are three to 400, 500 pounds overweight and losing wow. a ton. And so it can definitely be done. But in general, it's just it's just easier to to be eating a keto diet, actually still getting in nutrients uh, for the time being and um, <coughs> and just making it so that you're not hungry and so that your body's burning more fat, regaining that metabolic flexibility. Um, and so I do think you gain, you know, being in ketosis mimics fasting a lot. But I think if you're looking for weight loss, if you're looking for performance, whether that's athletic or mental, uh, they both help a lot. But then, you know, if you're fasting for more than five or six days, it's hard to be, at, you know, performing well in athletics. Your brain feels sharp, but you're not taking any energy or any nutrients. And so at some point you start declining. And so I think uh, there, there are a lot of differences. And I think for most people who want to lose weight, ketosis is probably the better way to go. Yeah. Um, so the, to follow up her last question, uh, she said that, uh, uh, Suzette said one cup of green beans equals 15 grams of carbs. So I was very limited on vegetables. I did drink a lot of water though. That is it, something that I still get confused by. And I noticed for myself, maybe you have a, a, a different approach to this, but you know, I was like weighing all of my food. Yeah. I was like looking everything up. I was plugging everything into like my fitness pal and and even confused about not eating too many vegetables and not eating too many carbs from vegetables. Now, is is that a fair fear or because we have people like in the Bulletproof diet, they largely it's similar to keto, but right. says, you know, eat vegetables more liberally. What is your take on that? Yeah. So my take, particularly for people losing weight, is to eat vegetables more liberally particularly mm -hmm. cruciferous vegetables, which are higher in fiber and also leafy vegetables. So your spinach, your kale, things like that. Um, it's, it's very rare for those things and very rare also for cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and cauliflower, uh, or particularly broccoli, but also cauliflower, um, other things like that to, to push you out of ketosis. Uh, that is, they'll have some carbs in them, but honestly, they, you know, just eating them and you're usually eating with them, some, them with some fat too, unless you're steaming them, you're cooking them in some fat. And so right. the ratio there is going to almost always keep you in ketosis. Uh, so you know, if so, you're saying that if you're eating enough fat along with your veggies, even if the veggies do have a bit more carbs, that is going to help not to kick you out of ketosis. Is that what you mean? It, yeah, absolutely. And it does. Okay. And, th and that's a general statement because if you really want to be deep in ketosis, unless, you know, just hypothetically, let's say somebody had brain cancer and the research on brain cancer is pretty good. The ketosis probably helps with other forms of treatment like chemotherapy. If you wanted to be really deep in ketosis, I might I might be very careful. I, I like if I got diagnosed with brain cancer tomorrow and went into chemotherapy, I'd probably be eating five grams of carbs a day just because, you know, while I was treating it, I would want to be as deep in ketosis as possible. I'd be fasting, you know, three or four days at a time. Um, mm -hmm. But when you're trying to lose weight, I don't think you need to be that careful. Um, like I said, I think it's still good to be a little bit careful and to measure your ketones at first. But at the same time, I see very few people who can't lose weight because they're eating too many, too much spinach or too much kale or too much uh, broccoli or too much cauliflower. It's just, <laughs> why, it, you know. why, why, why are people having a hard time losing weight when they're trying ketosis? What, what are you, what are you seeing as the, as the major pitfall or thing they're doing wrong. Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, a lot of it, so dairy I see often, uh, mm -hmm. eating too much cheese or too much too cream. Too many nuts. Nuts. Or, I, was nuts really, I was just about to say, like, if you're eating a lot of nuts, a lot of nut butter, like if you're getting bottles or sorry, jars of almond butter and coconut butter and eating one a day, mm -hmm. it's, you know, a lot like of I calories. Said, yeah. Like I said, ketosis is not magic. It, it works super well for most people, but it's not magic. So if you're eating a, a jar of almond butter a day, it's going to be hard to lose weight because you're taking in four or 5,000 calories and you're probably not burning that much. Right. So uh, it's really hard. That Realistically, I could really stop there. That's the main thing that I see is that people just eating too much of these foods that are hyper palatable. Secondary to that, moving helps a lot. 
And I don't, you don't have to do any particular exercise. You don't have to do any particular weightlifting or anything. I mean, there's certain things I prefer and like, but realistically, like if you're not walking at least, you know, seven, 8,000 steps a day. And I know that's hard because people are busy. They have jobs um, or, you know, they have kids. They're going to be around Although kids, honestly, keep you active. So, uh, but if you're not moving, it's hard. It's hard for your body because your body, first of all, even if you are in a calorie deficit and you are losing weight, you'll lose a fair amount of bone and muscle too, which is not what you want to do because then you won't be burning as many calories. And also, you just won't look as lean. Um, right. Even for women who don't want to be bulky, you still want to retain all the muscle mass you have and all the bone density you have mm -hmm. because it's something that not only makes you look better, but it makes you healthier over the long run. A lot of the studies long term show that muscle mass and bone density are one of the major markers of how healthy you are. And mm -hmm. so realistically, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a cause of not losing weight, but it's something that I see really, really helps. Drinking a lot of water helps. Um, and just, you know, avoiding foods that are super high palatable. Also sleep. Uh, if you're going to bed really late or you're only getting four or five hours of sleep, it's really hard for your body uh, to do anything because your body's going to be very inflamed. There's a lot of stress on your body. And these are all things that don't sound sexy. Uh, we, you know, I'm, I'm not giving you a magic answer here. But the things that matter. You know, sleeping enough, not eating jars of coconut butter and moving around some, they just matter. You know, they, they make a difference for your body, uh, not just in terms of how much weight you lose and how you look, but how you feel in the long run and how healthy you are. Right. And this whole idea, just like with paleo, and I've definitely gotten into this trap before. Oh, well, if it's paleo or, oh, if it's keto, then that just gives me a, you know, a, a free <laughs> ticket to eat as much of it as I want, which yeah. is not the point. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, uh, my guest is Jeremy Hendon. We are talking about uh, paleo versus keto for weight loss. And um, so if you're just joining us, give us a, let us know where you're calling in from and if you have any questions. Um, so I do have a, another question. This is from um, Gay Patterson Wood. She says, what diet would you recommend as I have several autoimmune diseases? AIP diet has been recommended so how does this diet compare to AIP or what would be best for me? Yeah. Uh, so in my opinion, AIP is the best way to go if you, because in my opinion, the first thing people should focus on is healing various underlying conditions. Mm -hmm. I'm all about weight loss. I am not opposed to weight loss at all. I think weight loss is in general great for people. It's great in terms of health. It's great in terms of psychology. So I'm all about weight loss. Uh, and in fact, you know, you mentioned the keto 40, the keto 40 is geared for weight loss. That's really mm -hmm. what it's there for. And that's what we generally like a keto diet for. It's good for other things too. We, we go keto a lot of times just because we like the mental clarity and the energy uh, mm -hmm. as much as the weight loss. That said, you know, if you've got an autoimmune condition, you've got Hashimoto's, Crohn's, uh, Addison's, Graves, things like that. I think it makes sense to focus on that first and not even worry about keto at first. Now you can do both at the same time. AIP right. is effectively a stricter version of paleo. And you can definitely do a low carb version of, of AIP. It, it becomes really hard because AIP is also right. it's already very strict. I mean, you're right. cutting out practically every spice, like other than ginger and, and a few other things, you practically can't even eat any spices. And so it, it's hard. And I tell people you're that. Cutting out more, the, even more vegetables, even low carb vegetables. Yeah. Right. right. You don't have any, any of your tomatoes, any of your peppers, anything like that. And right. So it's, uh, you know, it's tough. And so I think if somebody's just going AIP, I wouldn't recommend that they go low carb at first. I would I'd keep eating fruits. I would keep eating sweet potatoes because I just wouldn't want to make it harder at first. And mm -hmm. I think it's important to get that under control at first. Uh, but then, you know, eventually you can do you can do both of them. You could just keep going AIP and cut out the sweet potatoes and cut out the fruits, just as with paleo. It's right. just at, at first, I, I for me, I wouldn't be doing it uh, because it's a hard transition to make. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one other thing, and then I, I want you to uh, tell us a little bit more about the Keto um, 40 program, and, and then we, we will wrap up. Let me just make sure that we have answered all of my questions. Um, I guess the one thing I do remember was <clears throat> when I first got started with Keto, um, when I tried it, I felt really, really bad. So the, the keto flu, I know yeah. that one thing that did help me was drinking a lot of bone broth in that time for like the different nutrients. But can you just um, maybe talk a little bit about the what happens in like the early stages of doing keto? 
Yeah. Well, it's what we talked about earlier. It's this issue of metabolic flexibility. And if your body is not able to metabolize, that is break down and burn fat for energy, uh, or at least it's not very good at it, then what's going to happen is because you're not good at it, your brain in particular is going to feel tired and lethargic. You might even get headaches or you have other issues. And the reason that it happens is because all of a sudden your brain and the rest of your body is like, oh my God, I don't have any energy. You know, mm-hmm. I feel like I'm dying. I feel like I'm starving or whatever. Um, now, in essence, nothing bad's happening, but your body's just not getting enough energy, particularly your brain. And so it does feel bad. Are there tricks and ways to get over that? Yes. But for somebody who maybe is trying keto for the first time, who has, uh, particularly who has some insulin sensitivity problems or some blood sugar issues, mm-hmm. um, even all the hacks I can give you those first two to three days might be a little bit painful. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't want to, I just don't want to sugarcoat it. And sugar coating is maybe the wrong analogy to use here with the key to that. But uh, it's, uh, you know, I don't want to sugarcoat it. it. It might be hard for you for the first two or three days. Mm-hmm. You can, you can drink bone broth. You can, you know, one of the main things actually to do and one of the main things, reasons bone broth works is most people don't get enough sodium. Uh, everybody's scared of salt because when you eat a lot of processed food, you know, if you're buying bread and crackers or you're eating out all the time, you're getting plenty of sodium because processed food has tons of sodium. If you're not, if you're eating just unprocessed meats and seafoods and vegetables and fruits, almost that, all of that has almost no sodium. And so you're actually not getting a whole lot of sodium. You actually need more because our bodies need sodium. And so one of the main reasons that you have keto flu is actually your body, when you go into ketosis, starts expelling a lot of water. And the reason that is, is because when you store carbohydrates as glycogen in your muscles and other hepatic tissue in your body, your well, and your hepatic tissue, not other muscles, not hepatic tissue. But when you store glycogen in your body, uh, it's stored with water. I believe there are three water molecules for every one uh, sugar molecule that's stored in your body. I could be wrong about that. Uh, but you you start expelling a lot of water because your body's not holding on to any of that carbs. When you expel a lot of the water, a lot of electrolytes get expelled along with it, particularly a lot of sodium. And so if you're not taking in a lot of electrolytes at the same time, or a lot of sodium, potassium, and magnesium, then you'll experience a lot of these problems. All right, mm-hmm. So that's one way to help. But that's one reason that bone broth uh, helps. It's also one of the reasons that keto salts, like uh, perfect keto stuff, uh, works well, uh, is that you're getting some of those electrolytes plus some energy in there. And so there are things you can do, drinking more bone broth, eating more salt. Uh, but at the same time, there's some, to some degree, some people who are just starting the first two or three days are not going to feel great. And right. so maybe you want to plan like to start that on a weekend. You, start, you don't feel great when you start paleo either. Yeah. Your, body, yeah. your body is adjusting. Right, right. And, yes. uh, you know, you don't, you don't feel great when you start exercising. Because, no. I, mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, if you haven't exercised in five or ten years and you go to the gym, it's going to feel hard and then it's going to feel a little bit painful. <laughs> Yeah, sure, yeah. But it doesn't mean exercising is bad for you. It just means that you're not used to it and your body is starting to adjust. And so it's the same with, with keto and metabolic flexibility. So I have one last question and then um, we will, I would love for you to tell us more about Keto 40 because it, I know for me when I did keto, I mean, I'm, I've been a paleo chef and doing nutrition forever. I, and this, I think I tried it about two years ago. So there, there was a lot less out there. Um, I'm friends with Jimmy Moore, though, and yeah, I was actually Jimmy. able to text him and say, oh, my gosh, this is happening. And what about this? And I feel horrible. <laughs> Most people don't have, you know, a direct line <laughs> to be able to ask that question. So things like the Keto 40, like that would have helped me a lot back then. Yeah. And uh, um, because it is that there are nuances that um, yeah. y- you did a great job today helping to to clarify it, but it is, I mean, it is definitely something very new and there are caveats and, you know, we haven't even talked about ketone testing and am I in ketosis or not? That's like a whole other world. So um, my one last question though, because it seems to be everywhere is about these keto ketone supplements. And I know my father-in-law told me that he was taking ketone supplements and he was just he got turned on to these things and then he's like taking them in the morning and then just eating whatever he wanted for the rest of the day. And I was just really confused about whether that was a good idea. (laughs) Uh, 
it probably doesn't hurt. Like there's probably very little downside to your father-in-law doing that as, you know, as far as I can tell. Uh, it probably doesn't help all that much, although it might make him feel better. Sometimes those ketone supplements in the morning will make you feel better because they'll kind of wake up your brain. Uh, yeah, he likes them. Yeah, those ketones pass, you know, the ketone bodies pass through your blood-brain barrier. And so you'll actually get kind of a, a jolt of energy at that time. I felt like I was on crack when I was, <laughs> when I started to take it for a while. I couldn't, I, I couldn't keep doing yeah. it. It was like, um, I take alpha brain sometimes. Have you ever taken yeah. alpha brain? It uh, felt like yeah. a triple serving of alpha brain for me taking right. these ketone supplements in the morning. Yeah. Anyway. They, they can be really good. And uh, just disclaimer, I'm really good friends with Anthony who runs Perfect Keto. Uh, so, you know, I, I know him. I, I don't have any financial stake or anything. But um, they, I, you know, one of the things I actually think they're most useful for, and this doesn't get advertised a lot because not, I don't think it's popular enough. But if you're going to fast and you haven't been doing great uh, on your diet lately, I find that ketone supplements can be great for the first day or two of fasting to kind of get you over that bad feeling of fasting for the first day or two. Uh, and, and there's because the I think, ketones your body because your body is actually using those ketones easily yeah. for energy, right? Yeah, particularly your brain is your using brain. Them, and that's what okay. particularly makes you feel bad those first couple of days, your brain not getting enough energy. That's when you feel sluggish and you feel like you can't think. And so that, I found that particularly helpful. Now, that said, I don't think you need them on a keto diet at all. Uh, I think... Uh, so Amy actually just asked, I can see this on here, what are ketone supplements? And so very quickly, um, when your body breaks down fat, I said this at the beginning of, of our discussion, when your body breaks down fat in your body, you produce ketone bodies. There are three different types of ketone bodies. I won't go into the chemical structures, but your, your body produces these ketone bodies and it produces them for a reason. And that is certain cells in your body cannot use fat for energy. They can't use fat directly for energy. And they normally rely on sugar if you have it, like red blood cells, normally rely on sugar, glycogen, if you have glucose, if you have it in your blood or in your body. Uh, but when you don't and they can't rely on fat, they in turn rely on ketones, which are a byproduct of breaking down fat. So ketone supplements, the ones that we're talking about at least, like Perfect Keto or Keto OS, there, there are several other brands out there now, all they are, sorry, is they are bio-identical, and that just means – they're literally the exact same chemically uh, and structurally uh, as the ketone bodies that your body would produce as if it were breaking down fat. And ah, we, call them, we, we call them ketone salts because they're normally mixed with salt. And when I say salt, salt means effectively the electrolytes like magnesium, mm -hmm. potassium, and sodium. And they're normally mixed with those in order for absorption and for other reasons. They can actually be mixed with certain types of alcohols. I, when I say alcohol, I'm not talking about tequila. But they get chemi chemical alcohols, they can mix you those. Uh, those aren't nearly as popular. They're way more expensive. Uh, and there are only a couple. I'm not even sure if they're commercially available yet. But point being, so that's what these ketone supplements are, is you're taking these directly as if your body were breaking down the fats. And the reason you might be doing it is because, as we said earlier, your body might not be good at breaking down fats yet. And if your body's not good at breaking down fats or accessing the fat, then your body's not going to be producing many ketone bodies. And so you could take them at first and it'll make you feel a little bit better. Or even if you're already feeling good, like Camille is talking about, it might make you feel like you're on crack. You're like have, uh, three times the alpha brain. And so uh, that's, that's what they are. I don't think most people need them. However, I think they're useful in certain circumstances. Some of them can make you feel really good. And uh, yeah, that's. <laughs> Sorry. My no, no problem. babysitter just came back. That was super yeah. helpful for me. That's awesome. Okay. So let's, Talk about Keto 40. Sure. Tell me why it's so amazing. Well, I, so I've been asked this question a lot about a lot of different products that we've created over the years. We've created a lot of cookbooks and Paleo Keto and a lot of uh, other programs. Keto 40 is honestly the best program we've ever created. It's the best results we've ever gotten for people who've gone through it. We launched it first. So we, let me just first say we created it with Kate Bajar Miller. She is fantastic. And I apologize. I sometimes pronounce her name a little bit off. As the word Hard, is probably. Hardamio, yes, Hardamio. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so uh, she is fantastic. You know, she's certified in everything from the Institute of Nutritional Leadership to P90X to Beachbody. She's just, she's a ball of energy. I love Kate. Um, but so we worked with Kate to create this program because what we saw is that 
people, like you said, you had access to Jimmy. I've been on a couple cruises with Jimmy. I've hung out with Jimmy a lot. I love Jimmy. But <laughs> what we found was that people needed something that was set. So, you know, we included a six week meal plan for the 40 days. And what it is is a 40 day program where we guide you step by step through going into ketosis, what to eat, what to do, the things you're going to face. We send you daily emails with videos and challenges in the emails so that you have things to focus on each day. You know, you come to the pantry list, how to clean out your pantry, a shopping list for each of the meal plans that comes each week, exercise videos that Kate's put together. And these are easy exercise videos, so you don't have to have a gym or go to a gym or have any sort of membership. The things that you can do in your home, and even if you haven't been exercising, the things that you can do really super easily and that will get you into it. And the reason we did all of this is because we – I've seen the absolute best results for people, particularly when it comes to weight loss, when people have something that's set for a relatively short time. And so the reason we chose 40 and, days. And also a community. Yeah, yeah. Communities, community is so important. And mm -hmm. it's something that most people aren't looking for, by which I mean that, you know, and I know this is true for myself. Whenever I think, oh, I need to lose weight or I need to get in shape or something, I don't tend to go looking for a community. I have recently because I know how important it is to me. So I just recently there's joined lot, CrossFit a couple months a ago. a lot of research now showing that having a community accountability and support is this piece that has people be yeah. successful over the long term versus not, which is why Weight Watchers works for people, even though the actual oh, yeah. diet is sort of stupid. <laughs> well, there's, you know, a lot, was, you there's a lot of support. Before I created the Keto 40, uh, you know, we had thought a lot about Weight Watchers because, you know, Weight Watchers is not the best in terms of the food that they get you to eat, but they're fantastic in certain respects. And that is they really they have this accountability where you're going to either a class or to somebody to talk to them about once a week or sometimes even on the phone. So you're and they getting have on a scale in front of your peers. Yeah. Yeah. And you have a community. So you have the accountability, you have the community. And so we built that. We built a private group and we launched this first in October. Uh, we actually sold out in less than 48 hours. We didn't know how popular it was going to be. Yeah, We had a waiting list of over 200 people who wow. wanted to join, but we didn't let them in because we, we wanted to limit it to 100 people because we wanted to give personalized attention. We wanted to make sure we got great results for everybody who joined. And mm -hmm. it's going live again on January 3rd, and we're limiting it again. Uh, we've got a few more people in the group this time, but we're still limiting it. It's going to sell out. And so we're limiting it because you know Kate and Louise, my wife, and I were in – the private group, we're answering emails, we're answering messages, we're helping people through things, we're giving daily challenges, daily videos. Oh my gosh, I wish I would have had that group when I did keto. <laughs> that would have been so helpful. Yeah, and it's the things you don't expect. It's like you said, the community. Um, you know, honestly, the meal plan, just having the meal plan there alone is super helpful because if you, that's one less thing that you have to think about. You know, it's already a big lifestyle change, it's already a big commitment. So having a meal plan there, having a shopping list, having support, having something new to focus on each day. Like, okay, today we're going to focus a little more on movement. you got to get out and walk a little bit. Or today, you know, we're going to focus on uh, – sorry, I'm blanking at the moment. We're going you know, to focus on making sure you get enough vegetables and today you're drinking enough water. Uh, and so we've got little challenges like that. And some of them sound a little bit silly, but when you have that structure there uh, – and like I said, we created it for 40 days because 40 days is just long enough to start creating habits and to get amazing results, mm -hmm. but it's short enough that it doesn't feel you're like, like you're I'm doing this for the rest of my life. Because <laughs> oh. right. that's a really hard commitment. If you think yeah. about it, it like if you're starting from kind of ground zero where you've been eating badly for a while, not exercising very much, and somebody tells you, okay, here's what you got to do, but you got to do this forever or else you're, you're just going to go back to you where you were. You will never eat big another commitment. cookie ever. <laughs> zero, well, not just, zero paleo cookies for the rest of your life. And not just that, but it's actually, um, it's hard to stay perfect for very long, right? Our brains are so, not, we're not made to diet. Uh, you know, the humans that survived are the humans that did gorge themselves whenever they found enough food because food is not plentiful for most of, you know, history. And so what we found is that for 40 days, people can be very good. It's not that they never slip up, but they can be very good because they know it's 40 days. Mm -hmm. They know, okay, from January 3rd to just before Valentine's Day, I'm going to be extremely good. I'm going to be extremely strict, and they will be. They'll be extremely good, extremely strict. They've got the accountability and the support. Um, but if we tried to say, okay, let's be extremely strict for the next six months, that's hard. You know, yeah. by, the time, by the time Valentine's Day or, or much less like Easter or something rolls around, you're like, oh, my God, 
I, I, I haven't had anything, you know, any, any kind of cheat day for, for months. That's a long time. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. No, that's so, good. That, that makes sense. Which yeah. is why, you know, the whole 30 is incredibly, I always recommend the whole 30 to people for like the very same reason. It's a, yeah. it's imaginable, manageable amount of time for, for someone to wrap their minds around at the beginning, but it, and then by the time you get to the end of it, you're starting to feel so good that you may not, you know, continue yeah. on that straight and narrow path forever, but your body is, 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 you're getting that positive feedback and, and now you, you have that motivation and the habits that can fuel you to not necessarily keep going perfectly because I, I don't think that either of us are advocates for, you know, yeah. having, you know, for just, putting yourself through pain and not, not to say that you know, but <laughs> we're not advocates of doing this one thing forever. And I love sure. that we distinguish like being able to go back and forth between paleo and keto. Um, so that, that, that really, that really makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah it's a, like you said, it's a stepping stone. You know, you might not be perfect after 40 days, but you've made progress and you don't go back to where you were. Right. right. You know, if you were say perfect for the 40 days, then, you know, maybe you drop back 20 or 30 percent after that for a while. Right. And then maybe you do another keto 40, you know, uh, four or five months down the road. And then you drop back 20 percent from where you get after that. But still, you're, you're stepping up each time. You're doing better and you're making progress. You're building these habits which last after that. And that's actually the most incredible thing we've seen. We got amazing results from people during October and the first part of November. But those results have stuck. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, people have lost weight, they've kept it off, they've reduced inflammation, they're still eating better, they're feeling better, they have tons more energy, tons more mental clarity, uh, and it's sticking with them. And that's, I think that's the best indicator that something's really working well. Totally, totally. I couldn't agree more. Well, this has been amazing. Um, oh, one last question that from Amy. Amy said, you advocate strict paleo forever. I don't well, what's really. Your, what, what's your take on that? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I have gone through, I, I don't know, just those two words. The first thing I want to say about that, the word strict and the word forever, both of those things <laughs> feel like, <laughs> um, and, and I, I, paleo is a way of eating. I think paleo is for me has become a little bit different because, I mean, I had this concept when I first started paleo that I don't have anymore that like, oh, my gosh, there's so little to eat on paleo. Right. But now that I've been largely paleo for the last four years, you know, provided that I'm cooking for myself at home. I mean, the things that I can eat are endless. There's like there's almost nothing that I don't know how to make paleo. Right. And have it taste good. So um but then if we're going out or we're doing something, then yeah, then I'll, I'll eat other things. I, it also really depends on where you are in your health. If you, you know, if you have a lot of serious health problems, then, you know, the level of, of rigidness is going to be a little bit different, but I don't like the word stricter forever very much, very <laughs> much at all. But I do like healthy lifestyles that work for people and feeling yeah. good. And that is the point of keto. That's the point of paleo. Um, if you have an autoimmune condition, certainly that's the, the point is always to help your body come back to a healthy, a healthy set point. And, right. um, and everything that we're talking about is, is tools to, is, is tools to do so. It's not about just depriving yourself for, for the fun of it. So the way I look at it, because I'm, I'm on board with you. I mean, uh, you know, we eat rice. I've had rice a couple times in the past week uh, sometimes and, you know, do other things that are not strict paleo uh, as far as, you know, strict paleo is typically classified. Um, the way I view, at, view it is, um, you know, let's not fool ourselves that eating bread, like, you know, gluten and these things or eating, you know, cookies, things, they're not healthy for us, right? No. Um and so I don't fool myself. That doesn't mean I never do them. Um, but I, I consciously make choices when I do, uh, which is not all that often. But when I, when I eat these things, when I eat foods that are not paleo or not healthy, uh, I know what I'm doing. And, and I'm much better. Like I don't tend to go very far down that rabbit hole. I don't think I've had a milkshake or a donut as long as I can remember. And by the way, milkshakes were my favorite food ever. So. I, you know, of the, all the things I miss, milkshakes at the top of that list. But 
Um, oh, I could I could give you a recipe for a dairy free milkshake. You wouldn't even. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't even I, care. I, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but no, I mean, but when I have something that's not quote unquote strict paleo, I just I know what I'm doing, uh, and I've been doing this for a long time. I think we've been paleo for about ten or you know, about ten or eleven years now. Uh, and I, you know, Louise and I kind of know what we're doing now. We make conscious decisions. We don't fool ourselves into saying, oh, it's, it's a healthy cheat meal. We need to do it. Or we need to eat. Uh, no, I mean, we don't. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, so we don't, we definitely don't stay strict in that regard, but we also don't fool ourselves that it's something that's good for us, which I also find some people do They're like, oh yeah, I need this cheat day. It's really good to, to refuel my body with, um, you know, junk food for a day. Well, no, not really, <laughs> but. Yeah, but it's totally. not the end of the world either. Right, right. Unless you're someone who is dealing with something like incredibly ca sure. catastrophic. But that, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. if, we're talking about, if we're talking about AIP, you got to be a lot stricter for a longer time. I just, right. You got, if you got serious Crohn's issues, you know, I, right. I feel what, for you because right. you got to be what really strict. Right, what could have you, like, give you a flare-up, yeah. which that's, yeah. that's another story. Um, okay, I think that we have come to the end of this. And this has been awesome. I think that everyone who joined live seemed to get a lot out of it. So thank you so much uh, for being here with us and sharing all of your wisdom, Jeremy. We really appreciate it. Uh, for those of you who are interested in uh, joining Jeremy in the Keto 40, there is a link um, to learn more in the in the description. And um, yeah, they can. Uh, you can learn about that there. If you um, would also like to be notified about our upcoming Facebook Lives, there is another link. Um, we'll send you a little notification saying that we're going live so you can join in on the fun with us. And um, next week, I have, um, we're going to be doing Facebook Lives um, Tuesdays and Thursdays ongoingly around this time. Um, definitely sign up for um, my list if you are not already on uh, the list at paleokitchen.tv. Uh, next week on Tuesday, I'm going to be doing probably some sort of like keto latte or something with a lot of fat because that's what that's what we're talking about these days. And um, and then I'm going to have an interview on Thursday that is not yet been confirmed. But uh, yep, just click you want to be notified in the link above or um, sign up for my newsletter at paleokitchen.tv and you will get all that goodness. And to learn more again about Keto 40, the link is also in the description. So Jeremy, thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody for being here and we'll catch you next time. Bye.